informed, uh, as opposed to just a, a general audience of folk who, who also uh, are interested, but it's a different kind of, of lecture. Uh, and also, Elizabeth is uh, uh, one. Eric, where are you? Where, oh, there. Will you ask your questions when I get to questions, please, because they were good questions. If I jump right now to, yeah, OK. Uh, for, for one of the things he said was, you said Brian McLaren has said publicly that, I saw that, Father, uh, that, <laughs> that, uh, that uh, uh, he would be uh, uh, Episcopalian if he were an emergence, uh, and that it sounded as if I was regarding emergence Christianity as another denomination. It's not. It's just a whole different way of being Christian. It's, it's going to be the sixth uh, of the things. And before it's over, it'll be about 50% of the Christians in the world, probably, or at least in Latin uh, Christianity. So it's not a denomination in any way. It's as distinct uh, from us as we are from orthodoxy. Uh, common roots, obviously, uh, but a distinct presentation. Siblings, all of us, of the great thing. Now, the, what, a, what I want, and, and Elizabeth's right, we need to go uh, as quickly as possible to Q&A. So I want to do two things. I want to finish what I was trying to um, uh, build here. And that is that don't let anybody persuade you that somebody in emergence Christianity is saying scripture is no longer the authority. That just annoys me to death. That's like saying it's a generational thing, which means it's going to go away. It's a way of, of domesticating the whole thing so it won't bother you. Um, in the same way, saying that it's, scripture is not going to be the authority is a way of ignoring uh, what's really happening. Scripture, every time we have done one of these things that I have now lost, every time we've done one of these things, we have gone through a redefinition of the canon and or a redefinition of how it was going to be presented. Now, you can like that or not like that, but you know, Martin Luther had that anti, anti legomena thing uh, in which it was the less than using Eusebius' term um, because uh, Lutheran Christianity does not sit well with uh, the letter to the, uh, the epistle to St. James, for instance, and it really doesn't sit well with part of Peter. And so, if you will remember, he tried to put those books over into where the Apocrypha now is. He contested the canon. Uh, he contested the equivalence or the covalence of all of the books in it. Uh, and that follows a tradition. The same thing every time that, that has happened. Uh, a re reconfiguration of where Scripture is. So that what we are now talking about is a theology of Scripture. And this I really don't do with lay audiences much. But one of the things you are going to have to develop either privately or in, in a seminary basis or something uh, is, is some sort of theology of scripture that will help the people you lead understand what the authority of scripture is going to hold, but it's going to be a slightly different kind of scripture. I said a minute ago, books are now, Bibles are now coming out that don't have the verses and the chapters anymore. Um, uh, the first one came out about a year and a half ago. But you can look, during the Perry emergence, you can look at the fact we've been adjusting it now for almost 100, uh, 809 years. If you go to 1900 and you go to, Carl, uh, to Carl, um, Louis Claps, Claps, Carl, Carl Claps, uh, who was editor of Christian Century, uh, uh, Christian Herald, uh, and in 1900 he got the idea of printing the words of Jesus in red. You know, and we were off and running. It's that recent. And the reason was to try to, already he was feeling for a relationship. Emergence Christianity is enormously relational. And he was trying to get Jesus out of all the versification and the junk uh, and get at him. And then you've got Scofield right behind him. And it's straight, then you get J.B. Phillips in the middle of the last century with the good news. What a bestseller that was. What a breath of fresh air to be able to embrace it uh, with, with some relational feeling. Uh, and you get, if you're from my part of the country, you get the Cotton Patch Gospel. And baby, if you don't know the Cotton Patch Gospel, you are in such trouble. Because what happens is he goes down to the store, and he pulls him up a barrel, and he sits. And the brothers and the sisters, they sit there with him. And he says, the kingdom of God now is like that fur field right out there beyond the border of a town. That's the Cotton Patch Gospel. Uh, uh, and it, it's been a huge seller. Um, then, uh, and, and you go from there to Eugene Peterson's The Message, which I hope you know, for goodness sakes, if you don't. And thing after thing, all of it an attempt. Uh, my own, the words of Jesus, and this is not a commercial, uh, but, but the words of Jesus, the uh, gospel of the sayings of our Lord, uh, was an attempt on the part of Josie Bass 
uh, to a arrive at that. Um, one of the things that informed the last century and was a big part of the peri-emergence was the quest for the, uh, for the historical Jesus. Uh, because it rests on modern, it's kind of the last gasp of modernity in many ways. Modernity assumes historicity. It assumes that there is such a thing as a fact. Uh, and that you can look at scripture and look at scripture and say, this couldn't possibly have happened, get rid of it. Uh, this, and I'm not talking about Thomas Jefferson's philosophy of Jesus of Nazareth. I'm talking about questioning the virgin birth could not have happened. Uh, the, the resurrection could not have happened. Thing after thing that, didn't, that doesn't his, make historic sense or that in terms of critical um, uh, contextual criticism um, or deconstruction don't seem to hold up. That's the search for the historical Jesus, and it rests upon the concept of historicity. Emergence Christianity does not recognize, neither does postmodernity, uh, historicity as a valid principle. Uh, and given that, uh, now the, the quest is for the canonical Jesus. Uh, and um, I'm teaching a course right now, or my avatar is somewhere, I think even as we speak, actually, uh, for Church of the uh, Church of the School of the Pacific on the, uh, the quest for the canonical Jesus. It's the second such course I've done in a seminary. And it has to do with the recognition that you know, when it gets right down to it, all we've got is the canon. When it get right down to it, second night of Tay, I'll grant you that. And Niebuhr's right, second night. But that's what we've got. Uh, and at some point, we have to trust, and it's here again, the beloved community to have known in the spirit of discernment what was and was not said or consonant with the Jesus that they knew. So a theology of scripture is a biggie, uh, on, or it should be, uh, a biggie on, on your checklist of things to be doing uh, in, in your church. Uh, the uh, last thing, and then I promised Elizabeth I would go to Q&A, but I would be derelict, I think, if I didn't do this. Uh, we speak of emergence Christianity and emerging emergent uh, congregations or, or gatherings or cohorts. Cohorts is actually their word um, in this country. In uh, the UK and by uh, consequence in its colonized areas, New Zealand, Australia, uh, it's got the, um, the expression is fresh expressions. They are fresh expressions cohorts or they're fresh expressions churches. An attempt to get rid of the confusion between the great emergence and, and this thing in part. So when you see fresh expressions, you're talking about the same thing, more or less sort of, okay? <laughs> but, but fresh expressions is, is what they are and, and, and they are emergent. Now, the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, has been deeply involved in, uh, in the Fresh Expressions uh, movement. And if it helps, and I think it does, Ray Anderson, who is emeritus now at uh, Fuller, just in the last year, did a book called <laughs> the Emerging Theology for an Emergent, Ch Emergent Theology for an Emerging Church, in which he takes the metaphor of the church in Jerusalem as inherited church and the church in Antioch as Fresh Expressions Church. Uh, and he says, if you can put your head into the fact that what's happening right now is very analogous to what happened in the first century, and if you can begin to see that if you stay Anglican completely, uh, or anything else, you are really the church in Jerusalem, but you've got this other thing out here happening, which is a fresh expressions of church. And then he goes on and say, to say, and he's absolutely right, you must realize that Antioch kept coming back to Jerusalem for imprimatur and for guidance. They did. Paul made two or three trips. But when it came right down to it, when Jewish clergy, rabbis, got ready to jump ship, it was Antioch they went to. When we have a problem called homosexuality, they had a problem called circumcision. We have a problem called domesticity. They had a problem called meat in the shambles. Each time there was some sort of conversation between the two, but it is Antioch that absolutely did survive. It was Antioch that took the message on. And he laughingly says, but you have to remember that when Jerusalem got in financial trouble, Paul or, or Antioch took up a purse and sent some money home. So there's hope. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, and that is true. Uh, fresh expressions. Um, uh, Ray Anderson, I'm so glad you asked. Do we, uh, where is Elizabeth? I, uh, we did a bibliography and I don't know. Uh, oh, oh, good, okay. Okay, good. So there is, so, uh, and, and I hope all of this is on there. Bibliography changes every day. And, uh, so I, but Ray Anderson is a, a quite a good thinker uh, in all this. So fresh expressions, when you hear that, is uh, the, the British term uh, for what we're talking about except 
that it is a joint effort between the Church of England, uh, or the Church of England in Australia, whatever, uh, and the United Methodist Church. Uh, it is an attempt. John Wesley died in his rabbit, uh, you know, and he should never have given it up. Uh, and there is a coming together uh, of the UMC. It has not happened in this country yet, although they are trying to join us, as you probably know, uh, a thing with the Lutherans in Call to Common Mission. Uh, they're trying to join us so that uh, there, there is this, this coming together. Fresh Expressions also tries to cover not just the pure emergence uh, cohorts, but also those that are alt-worship or alternative worship, if you will, that are network worship, that are, are a little nearer to Mother Church, okay? Now, what, in the, in the book, we speak of hyphenated, and, and you need to understand that that means those people who are emergence in sensibility, they are communal, uh, they are deeply incarnational. They are so Jesus-centric that I don't know how the poor man stands it every once in a while. Uh, they are, are so missional, it's incredible. Uh, they are so chaotic and, and happy to be chaotic. Uh, they are leaderless. Uh, they absolutely are playing with monasticism, and they are deep into the ancient disciplines, and they desperately wish they had been born in the third century. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and, and all, all of the, those are emergence Christianity sensibilities, all right? But they are also incorporated in bodies that were weird Anglican, going to die in Anglican. Thank you very much. Uh, and so I'm not leaving here. So I'm going to put a little of this and a little of that together. That's happening in every de denomination in this country, in the UK, all over the world. The Presbyterian the Presbyterian Church in this country, has been much more responsive, much more aware of what was happening, and clearer to them that they might not get a Presbyterian congregation out of this puppy, but they sure were going to get some Christians out of it. Uh, and, and so the liberal has been much uh, uh, more careful in seeing that there is money than has anybody uh, else. Right now, even as we speak, the president and merchants uh, are all meeting uh, in the church headquarters in Louisville. Um, and uh, Troy Bronsink, if you want to uh, look at some of their work, Troy Bronsink, who's a uh, pastor in Atlanta, is the titular head of Presby Emergence. Uh, uh, Ken Sloan uh, is a big spokesman. Uh, Adam Walker Cleveland uh, is a big spokesman. Any of those people, if you Google them, you will see. Or if you just Google Presby Emergence, you will get the minutes of what they, because they're all over YouTube and uh, Facebook both. Um, and, and so they are there. Um, they call themselves loyal radicals. They're the only ones who do, and I think it's a very good term, loyal radicals. That's exactly what they're there. And they're trying to figure out how to be church within emergence Christianity sensibility while being more Presbyterian than Calvin was. Uh, and it's a trick. Uh, we, the Anglo-emergents um, have, uh, I, I'm proud to say, that uh, we are just now beginning to really come uh, to the fore, and, and it's Bishop Catherine. Uh, the Bishop, uh, Archbishop Rowan Williams has certainly done it in England for the last five or six years. There is an office, now five years, uh, there's an office at Lambeth now for Fresh Expressions. Uh, it, will, it has been run by Stephen Croft, uh, and he is being elevated to the episcopacy um, in, in May. And uh, the office is being taken over by Graham Cray, who is presently <laughs> Bishop of Maidstone. Uh, so it's elevated to uh, the level of attention of, of a, an episcop um, that, he's, that he's doing it. Um, so that Bishop Catherine uh, is very aware of Anglo emergence. And uh, Anglo emergence, if you'll go to angloemergent.ning.org, uh, you'll see what some of us look like. Uh, on, huh? Dot com. Is it a dot com? <laughs> Sorry, okay, dot com, yeah. Uh, I, 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 oh, okay, all right, okay, all right, good. I hadn't seen that. You'll see what we look like. Um, the, one of the reasons I'm excited about it is that uh, about uh, eight, nine months ago, uh, Bishop Catherine appointed two full-time staff members to 815 staff, uh, and their, their job is to, in part, to large part, uh, to interface with the anglo emergent movement uh, in this country and to figure out what to do with emergence Christianity uh, as it interfaces with Anglicanism. Uh, Tom Brackett, uh, B-R-A-C-K-E-T-T, -T, Maria's <laughs> grinning because she knows it, and so is Elizabeth. I think we're going to make some mayhem with Tom Brackett in this very room very shortly. Is, is that our sometime? Yes. Um, Tom Brackett is, uh, even as we speak in England right now, uh, uh, with uh, at Lambeth, uh, looking at exactly what Fresh Expressions looks like. 
uh, as, as we do it in the UK, and how you can put alt worship and network worship and all of that under the same umbrella, which in this country, because we're larger, we probably are not going to be able to do. Uh, I suspect that alt worship is a different thing. But in all of this, the point is that there is a whole spectrum from the absolutely traditional Episcopal church. And if you've got one of those, great. Over to that which is, would like to clean up its act and put in some Celtic, and put in some Celtic um, even song or some taze or, or do something like that, and maybe open up a confessional, all the way over to, uh, to, to these folk uh, who are Anglo emergent or who are alt worship. Uh, the alt worship folk would, would really like it if you would just let them have the building uh, on Tuesday night and go away. Uh, you know, don't ask and you'll be happier. Uh, but don't let your vestry know you signed off or at least get your senior warden to do a CYA before you sign off, whatever, because uh, it's dangerous. Uh, but, but all worship, network with three or four um, parishes will go together and allow, one of the problems for emergence with our system or with any system uh, of Protestant uh, origin or Anglican origin is that it's got real estate. Uh, and, and real estate means that the community has to come to the real estate. Whereas um, group, uh, emergent theory uh, works on the principle that wherever it emerges, that's where the community is, that's where the self-organizing thing is, and that's where you better be. Uh, and so it's very hard to take the cathedral and move it a half a mile away to where the action is. It is not hard to rent the bowling alley that is no longer used and to put it in there. It's not hard to help it happen in, in the park. And if you want to see one of the most active uh, ones that is totally without real estate, look at Ecclesia Ministries, if you don't know that. Uh, uh, Debbie Little, uh, Little Wyman. Uh, Ecclesia Ministries is um, uh, essentially all homeless. Uh, the most recent ordinance was Pastor Bob, who was ordained in, uh, did you see it on YouTube, who, who was ordained in September, October, I guess, in uh, Woodruff Park, which is right off of Peachtree Avenue in Atlanta. Uh, and uh, Pastor Bob, while he was in seminary, had been ministering to that congregation of about 80 folk. Uh, and, um, and so when it came time to ordain him, Bishop Mitchell from the Diocese of Atlanta uh, came out to the park, and so did 13 other bishops, and they were doing it in our best style, you know. And, and, and St. Albans in Alberta had set up a table so everybody would have a feast, and we were going to do this with Pastor Bob. And just as the bishop laid his hand on Pastor Bob, one of the gentlemen who had been pastored by him for three years um, didn't understand what we did, and he just came up and shoved the bishop's hand right over here so we had a lateral, okay? Uh, and he put his hand here too, because that was his pastor. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's moments like that, uh, that that are very touching. Uh, so we think apostolic succession goes through the ear just as well as it goes through the cranium, whatever, you know. Uh, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's a fair statement. And let me take it from there and say, let me jump. There is a thing, uh, it's five years old now, and most five-year-old books aren't worth talking about But in this day and time, thanks to the clip. But there is a thing uh, that the Archbishop's Council for the Church of England uh, published, and you can download it. It's called The Mission-Shaped Church. Now, there's a subsequent uh, a volume called, um, oh gosh, what is it called? Uh, I, I, you can tell I don't like it particularly. I'm blank as a wall what the second one is. It, it, I, it may be, but the mission-shaped church is the one in, in, which, uh, the arch, in which they're laying out network churches, alt-worship churches, frankly emergent churches, frankly, you know, the whole spectrum is there, and they're saying what you just said, in effect. This is mission. Home mission is not sending somebody to Appalachia to sit on a three-legged stool on a mud floor and convert people who've been converted for 200 years, just not your way. It is about the fellow next to you because the fellow next to you probably is either unchurched, dechurched, or non-churched. And, and those are distinctions that, that came out of this very significant study in the Mission Bay. That is to say that the non-churched are the majority right now. We in this country are in our second and a half generation of people who are biblically illiterate. 
That is, they may have attended a service or two along the way, uh, but they basically, they don't know the story. They don't know, it, it's, it's, it's lost on them. It's just not there. Uh, and, and so they're, they're non-churched. They never were churched. They're huge in number. They are suckers for emergency. They are absolute. The growth is in this category. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, you're a witness. That's right. Uh, that's right. Yeah, there she sits. Yeah. Uh, it's absolutely true. The de-churched fascinate me, and I will be crude. They're the ones who are so, they were weird Christian, probably fundamentalist, and they are so pissed they'd never go back. You know, they are not going to touch it. Don't you talk to me about it. Don't you come near me with it. I was injured that way. But I sure would be willing to get out on the net and spy at BeliefNet or spy at Explore Faith or lurk on a blog or, you know, and I will show up at a beer and Bible about one time in every five. I'll show up at a pub where we're doing God talk. They will never go into your structure again because it represents everything. Now, probably they come near going into an Anglican structure than a traditional Protestant one, but they're not going to do it. They're just not. And then the unchurched are those who've changed jobs seven times in the last five years and just never got around to joining anything. Uh, and they are the lukewarm. Uh, you know, nothing worse. At least the de-churched are mad, uh, and they know they're mad, uh, and there's a certain energy uh, to it. That's the division of the mission field, and we would do well to remember it as, as, as priests and as, uh, as uh, informed laity as we lay uh, our plans out. Now, okay, that was the thing I said I had to, uh, that I really wanted to say because the missional, the missional part of emergence is huge, and it's not that they're proselytizing. It's almost that they can't help themselves. Uh, you, you, know, you open up uh, a, a Bering Bible in a pub, and, and you're going to have 60 people uh, before it's over, and you're going to split into two or three. I mean, it just happens, uh, and it varies that. So almost you have to be actively against home missions uh, to stop this thing. Uh, but anger emergence are uh, important. Yes, now, but questions? You're also saying with, with missional emergence that there's a dialogue, there's a welcoming dialogue. Absolutely. As she is not a shell. I did not put her in there. The, one of the things that emergence will tell you, and, I, and it's very much like addictive uh, uh, therapy uh, theory. Anyway, they will look you in the eye and say, you know, to be an Episcopalian, you have to believe something. You just have to be able to say you believe it. You have to stand up and, and say, and you have to behave in a certain way, or at least fake it. And if you're Episcopalian, you're lucky in this category because where, you know, three or four of us are gathered together, there'll always be a fifth and other uh, uh, things like that, which makes behaving a little easier. But, and then over here, <laughs> well, it's true. When you've done these things, then you can belong. And they will say to you, if in, in emergence Christianity, you belong the minute you indicate you want to, the minute you show up. Don't care whether you're Hindu or, or Buddhist or agnostic or the child of Richard Dawkins. It just does not matter if you want to be here. And in time, you will begin, if you stick around, they're not going to mess with you. But if you stick around, you're going to behave like we do, simply because we're all simian, I think. Anyway, you're, and one day you will wake up and realize, son of a gun, I believe something. And it will have been this process. Wimber called it the difference between bounded set and center set. Uh, he was the first to articulate this particular thing. Wimber, uh, uh, but it's an important distinction because you're absolutely right. All are welcome, and we're not going to screw with you. You know, we will be what we are, and you can be it or not. Yeah. Uh, two things. One is uh, when Will preaches the real word. They yes. Hang. They just wanted to hang. Here's the question that I do, do you all know what he's talking about? Because Will, the Will occurred because you're right here. Uh, that was $14 million that Bill Hybels just trashed. And I, I respect so much his honesty. Yeah. 
He just came out and said, we realize we're not forming them spiritually. We're going to throw the whole thing away and become, he said, an emergent church was what he said, actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I revealed God, or I was talking to, uh, who's it the other day, yeah. Arnson, I couldn't think of. I think we do either. I think that, because I, I said, you know, I'm a great part of the institution for decades, you know, a lifetime, and, and believe that the movement of the church is completely away from where we've been in relationship Absolutely. to yes. reaching people where they are, not waiting for them to come to us. Although, trained in that model, it is very difficult to discern Absolutely. what success is, what is development Absolutely. when brought up and taught, taught that uh, success is measured by butts in the pew. Yeah, so absolutely. We're realizing now that to, in, in our institutions now are trying to teach congregational development when, when in fact the movement is just the opposite. Don't teach congregational oh, development. It is not what you ought to be teaching. Heresy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So don't teach don't do it. You know, you got everything you kind of need. How do we, how do we not get sucked into thinking, well, we're there when we're not there? Uh, in terms of, um, well, how do I not get sucked into thinking I'm there when I'm not? Yeah. The rest. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Forget the rest. No. 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 I, no. I understand. I think there's an answer here, right? <laughs> Good for you. Trip, you've got to answer. Uh, I, I, maybe. Um, so let's, I, I, one of the things I think that we're all struggling with, and this because it goes back to this belong, behave, believe, what does belong mean? And in our minds, belong means you're sitting in our pews. But what if belong means you're behaving like we do or practicing what we practice? So with something as exportable, believe it or not, as exportable as Anglican, Ex yeah. they belong when they start processing and create their means to visual services. They may never walk into the building, but they belong when they have these divisions. And that's the thing that's so hard about institutional Christianity and mainline Protestantism is that we have forgotten that it actually exports itself. That people, to use your model, people will go to Jerusalem, ooh, cool pictures, let's use them. Oh, they have yeah. icons, rock and roll, done. And <laughs> that's right, that's exactly right. They're off to the races. I think that that's, we have got to somehow put that in the success column. You know, and that's the piece, I think, that's the stuff that's beginning to convince me that my congregation is growing. I'm trying now to convince my congregation that I know that there's no one in the pews, but we're networked everywhere. And it drives the vestry crazy. It, oh, it drives them nuts. Absolutely. No, it's going to, yeah. And I think it's so important that we remember we do have to save the institution too. Uh, or, or at least we don't we don't want to burn down the homestead. We might want to go home for Christmas. You know, kind of yeah. One of the models that's sure to get you in trouble, uh, I know two or three priests who've been shipwrecked on it, but it works. Uh, you know, he becomes a sacrificial animal and the, the thing is, works. Um, 
uh, is if you can uh, take your building and uh, <coughs> get rid of the pews. No, take your, build, uh, your building and use it as the, fo the focus for uh, several churches or, or, or cohorts or whatever that you have seated out there. Uh, or that have sprung up and that come to you looking for a place to distribute food, for instance, to the homeless, or, or to be able to uh, do a, a Celtic Mass uh, uh, from time to time, or to, so that it becomes like the old cathedral used to be, I guess, really, uh, the, the town square where they feed in. The problem is you have to disestablish what you've got, and your vestry really doesn't. I th you know, it sounds so pat and clever, but I swear it's... It's lay education. It really is lay education because they're not going to stop this tsunami. Uh, it, it, it's, you know, it's not going to get stopped. The only thing we can do is to hope to educate them at a level that, that they have conversation about it because it's very unsettling to many laity. Do you think? I do. Okay. That's encouraging. Why would, largest, why would the largest growing segment of, the, of Christianity be the unchurched if they don't in some sense get the idea that the, the institution can be a hindrance in one's uh, immersion in a life in Christ versus a, a help? I mean, that was part of the... Oh, yes, then, then I do. I misunderstood what you were saying. I, I, I thought you were saying that they think that the institution uh, is to be saved and... and uh, well, not. I think the men, oh, I, I think yes. Yeah. But I Sanctuary is a good word. Sanctuary is the word. I ran into somebody one Sunday. That, you know, they were out enjoying a beautiful afternoon, and they said, well, you know, uh, you know, we're going to come to church this morning. And I'm not a guilt-driven person. I said, yeah, you know, what a beautiful day to be playing tennis or whatever. He goes, right. And I said, but, you know, why, why do we bother still having a worship? And you know the point is, because if we want sanctuary, i.e. liturgy and all, we want to be able to come and participate in it. But in the meantime, can you meet us out here? Yes, you, exactly. You know, which I, that's why I'm trying to get at this. And I, I have a sneaking suspicion it's going to take a lot longer than my lifetime, my kids' lifetime, to figure out, you know, how, how, what do we let go of? Mm -hmm. What do we let go of? The, the 11 o'clock service, for one thing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the 11 o'clock service is, is, is the first thing you let go of. Uh, and, and I'm being serious. Uh, it, it's true. Uh, it's going to soon kill itself. But um, uh, at, at some other time, uh, because, yeah. you know, people working 50 hours a week aren't going to give up uh, Sunday for it uh, if they can help it. But, yeah, it's going to take time. And, yeah, it really, yeah. I, I feel very sacrilegious saying this. Oh, good. Okay. So yeah. Eric. Yes. 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 None of us does.
And we can be. I think the two, the two questions are, if I understand correctly, are part and parcel of each other uh, in, in many ways. And they, they go right back to what you're saying. And I loved your word sanctuary, though I was interpreting it a bit differently from what you said. Um, because we, we are passionate uh, about going to church doesn't do it. But going into a space which is fully incarnational, which is uh, filled with art, art happening right there, uh, sculpturing, uh, uh, sculpting that's happening right there, uh, uh, you know, potting that's happening right there, dancers who suddenly get up in the middle of whatever we're doing as worship and begin to move. Those things are anathema to many of us, but they are really what worship is. Emergence Christianity wants worship space. And it wa it's great to be in a cohort. It's great to be in a beer and Bible. It's great to be in a house or cell church. But every once in a while, you've got to have some place where you can worship, which is part of what you were saying, uh, is that there needs to be the Episcopal Church can give that because we're neutral. And also, we don't have an iconostasis that's going to be wrecked by it. You know, uh, The Orthodox wouldn't dare let that kind of thing happen. Uh, we can do it. We've got all of the things that look like home. And we've got the tradition of, of the prayer book. We've got the liturgy. Anglicanism is the one that's positioned to, to help or to furnish the, the sanctuary, the spiritual sanctuary, uh, and, and the worship, to actually let the worship happen. Uh, now, this afternoon, no, tomorrow afternoon at the closing session, we're going to do prayers uh, over this afternoon and tomorrow with the general public. And we're going to do them out of, I don't think you've got it, but out of a, out of a breviary of a sort. Uh, which is the good Anglican way to do it. When we get ready to do the closing session at 3.15 tomorrow, it's not going to be in the books. It's going to be up there. And it's going to be up there because an emergent would say to you, when you do this, Episcopalian, you're inviting yourself into individualization. You're inviting yourself into yourself, which is a characteristic of Reformation theology. It's heavily individualistic. When you do it up there, we all ascend together. It's a big distinction. So there's going to be some adaptation, has to be, uh, adaptation of, of both the space and the way to do it. But Anglicanism, uh, the via media in, in no small part is, and the three-legged stool, the three-legged stool, you know, I have cursed the three-legged stool for years, haven't we all? Uh, but, but the metaphor is coming back and, and that fascinates me. It's going to be, I think, scripture uh, and, and it's, it's going to be the beloved community, and it's going to be, so, I'm not quite sure, because it's somewhere in here we're going to have to work in the spirit. What we're not in this conversation admitting yet is that Azusa Street happened, that Pentecostalism is about a quarter of this movement, and, and we're not accustomed to dealing with the Holy Spirit. We would like him to stay somewhere where we can rattle his bars instead of the other way around. And so, but, but... Uh, so it's going gonna, it's gonna, to, the agency of God or something, I don't know what it's going to be called. I can't tell yet. I'm in conversation with, with several of them to try to figure out what it's going to be. But, you know, here's the stool. Well, what hooker, and even when we put four legs on it and called it the quadrilateral, what we never did was put a seat on it. Never occurred to any of us. And it's the seat of authority, and it's Jesus. Jesus solus is what they're saying. Jesus Solus. And that keeps the legs apart and in tension, but it still keeps them attached, and it's where they move. I think it's a stroke of genius. It never one time dawned on me, of course we never looked at the seat. But, but you know, that's, but they're borrowing this kind of Anglican talk uh, because, it, because it's open enough. Uh, you know, via media, middle of the road where most accidents and all Episcopalians happen. I mean, we laugh about it all the time. You know? <laughs> But, but it has an enormous amount of flex. It has an enormous amount of flex. It's near enough to chaos so that it's attractive. And the, 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 the pension, if you will, for chaotic behavior uh, that informs us, it makes it very attractive too. Yeah? One thing from Cross's uh, perspective. Sure. We're, we're basically dealing and talking about advancing change. Sure. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm wondering, as we look to gather metaphors, a synopsis is terrible. 
It is terrifying. And, and is there, hopefully, new language that, that a metaphor thought about that. that would be uh, not as threatening? Because once they talk about threatening, reformation and all of that being what it was, but today, it, it, it is. It's true. As a communicator, I've always felt that language is very important. Absolutely. It's a brilliant point, and I never heard it made before, and I, I have no answer. But you're right. The red, yeah, what you think? Well, like brilliant I point. Something hanging on this about we are becoming more comfortable to work with the Holy Spirit because, yes, that is a, a thing that makes you want to turn the pattern into a surfboard and surf the tsunami, right? Yeah. And you can't throw yourself into the chaos, but it's also the enveloper and the comforter and that which binds us together. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> And more rhetoric, though. The rhetoric. Uh, Okay, well, the word. What I'm saying is, I think the words are part of the real opportunity here. I, I'm just thinking within my own parish. Yeah, a different vocabulary. I don't mean, I mean, I never thought about it before, changing the vocabulary. I say tsunami as if it were, you know, a spring shower, uh, <laughs> knowing it's not. That's right. That's absolutely right. How you've worked for seventy years is invalid. You have to like you have to chat them through them through that end of their life sort of yeah. thing, while also fostering the new growth in a way that hopefully is not threatening. And that's the situations where there's some sort of new poof and and they freak out because it doesn't fit into any of their <coughs> yeah. boxes. Right? And and mourn for them. Uh, uh you know. No, it's not funny to, to take the props out. Uh, Brian McLaurin's uh, book of about uh, a year ago now, Everything Must Shift or Change, Everything Must Change, uh, it is a very good statement. But even th remembering it as, as you were talking, I don't remember rhetoric that's less threatening than change and tsunami. Yeah, Tripp? Well, no, one of the things, it's me, a good point. That really bothers so. me. One of the things that Baptists are working really hard to rediscover right now is a language of continuity, ecclesial continuity. E. Clem Henson, who's a Baptist theologian, yes. talks about trading back our strength. That's right. Um, and so the first place you have to go is to Anglicanism. Um, so if you want to know where you came from, go back to England, and then you can get, trace it all the way back to Jerusalem. Um, but continuity, one of the things that I was wondering, I was, had the same question, I think, the tsunami metaphor is frightening. Not that this is necessarily more comforting, but it's just an option. Does the church realize that it's actually planted on a floodplain? <laughs> that every 500 years the waters rise and everything changes, but then you have the most fertile ground imaginable. That's right, you do, so every as time. As long as you know, I like that. that. <laughs> Glad you asked the question. Yeah, I like that. I, but just don't put your church on stilts. You're missing the point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because every time things get better, I mean, you know, and it, and it grows. It, Oh, I mean, yeah. I 
I think Anderson's work is just absolutely uh, groundbreaking, but I hadn't thought about it in terms of man. You're right. You can talk first entry history. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And locally and globally. And I think it's a piece that we don't actually do well at all. But, and it's also going to be expensive and it's going to be mm -hmm. complicated and whatever. But, and I, and that, I just think that we need to focus on that as, as significantly as we focus on the theology and the, you know, other aspects of what I would call language. And, we have a committee at St. Matthew's that's been thinking about the future for a couple of years now, but we were, have put posited forth a lot about technology and the internet as part of what we're looking toward. And I have some trouble with kind of the ageism that we, how we talk about the church too. And this committee, the oldest woman on the committee, 75, young. Yeah. Right? All right, sure. Um, I hope not, because I want out. I mean. <laughs> I think she's, she's absolutely, I, I love the drop down screen uh, to get out of the missile. I mean, most of us have said the prayers so often now that except for the ones particular to Saints Day or something, we go to glory and don't even use the book, which is even worse. I don't mean that. I mean, I was pointing to, um, do you know? And, oh. And, and, and sort of the um, way in which you would take all of that and to. Well, to, to be terribly, uh, second life, uh, yeah, to be terribly unoriginal at the parish level, I'm fascinated by the ones that are now, and it's expensive, I mean, you hit it. Uh, they, they're putting the uh, computers into the Sunday school rooms so that the kids are connecting diocese to diocese or culture to culture. And, uh, you know, it'll bring them to Sunday school uh, and, and, and generally they'll stay. Uh, the, uh, one of the funniest things that I, that I ever saw was uh, in Memphis when we had the first of the great emergent conferences, first national one. Uh, in, in the nave of the cathedral, there were two screens, and uh, the nave was um, wired um, and Wi-Fi. And they twittered, uh, and, and the audience was twittering, and uh, I was doing just fine until I looked out of the corner of my eye and saw a Twitter go by, what the hell did she just say? And it was uh, you know, very disconcerting. <laughs> Uh, to, to me, because I didn't know what I had just said, as a matter of fact. But, but, uh, but absolutely, she's right. And, and the ability to, um, Calvary itself is doing this, to, to bring uh, the homeless and the indigent in during the week to use those machines. And um, to because they almost all know the fact that they're homeless or psychotic doesn't mean that they don't need to connect with home or whatever. Uh, so that technology is there. And the, the ability to talk to other kids in a different parish so you have a diocesan sense, all you're doing is networking. But, uh, sh and and that's, that's only a part of what you're asking. Uh, the um, uh, Second Life, uh, you know, I mean, uh, let's face it, uh, Second Life, the, ca the cathedral on the Isle of the Epiphany, which Elizabeth told me not to go for there, but, but uh, 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 it's there. And it's now 850 people that opened in May, 850 congregants, five services a day. And Reverend Mark Brown, who in real life is executive director of New Zealand um, Bible Society, um, is uh, just left being priest in charge there, handed it over so that he can open up an Asian service uh, because he's bilingual apparently. And he's going to oversee uh, the addition of, of Asians to, to that congregation in their native tongues. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, it, it's there. It, I mean, that's all falls in the category of we don't like know what we can do. That's right. We don't know what we can do. But, and, and I, I go back to the fact that three, um, three priests in New Jersey grabbed me and said, you don't have to worry about it because if you're in any size town at all, you have a high school. And if it's any high school at all, it's got a computer sciences department. And all you have to do is hook with uh, the, the teacher in charge of the computer science department and say, could we work up an internship program between your courses and us? 
uh, and let the kid come in here and show us what to do or design a home page that really works or open. Uh, my favorite is uh, the gal who, who let the kid come in and make avatars out of her vestry. Mm -hmm. I love this. And, and every vestry member was given by the teenagers, a teenager, and an avatar. And the vestry reports were done on the home page uh, with avatars, uh, you know, because the, the high school kids got credit for knowing how to do it. And she said it cleaned up the vestry so much, you would not believe how meetings improved when they knew that the kid was watching whichever vestry person uh, she controlled that or he controlled the avatar for. Uh, but there are all kinds of things like that, you know. He, uh, yeah. <laughs> Good. And what was really great was um, the, uh, the last design was 12 years old. Sure. Yeah. And this kid, when I came to his house, you know, so I don't think it's going to tell him, but his house was great. We got, with my antiquated PowerPoint information, he looks at it, uh, he's got a map, he looks at it after 10 minutes, he says, he real like this, uh, Father, Father uh, Jerry, do you find it five years ago? What are we supposed to do with this? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. And you know, he, he just, not only was it fun, sure. that, you know, I don't know how to reach that great geometry, but he made a huge contribution to worship. And he couldn't be there, he was on a ski trip, so his 15 year old sister ran the whole thing for him. Yeah. It was absolutely tremendous. It's amazing. And the content was not too bad either. What I'm trying to get is a process of those young people. It, it, absolutely fun. Yeah. Yes. Well, that's what Nancy said. Yeah. Can I give you a really unpleasant answer? And then I'll turn it back. But I, I would say you find where that community is and nurture it, and it will eventually attract some of your people, and it will begin to network. And that takes five or six years, and you don't have it. And I hear you. I know that's not a good answer. Trying to commit to create the community within a fixed set of walls uh, is really hard. And now, having just rained on your parade, let, let me give it back to, to your colleagues. But, but it, it, it really is, um, it ultimately is the problem. You cannot have the place and make the community come to it. The community is out there, and you have to go to it and then make the place sort of that third good place. Ray Ollenberg's uh, theory of the third good place is so applicable. Uh, he was talking about bars and Starbucks. Uh, instead of the, near, the nearest nave. But if you can think of the nave as the third good place. Uh, we've got the model in our community, not in a lot of urban communities, especially we've got the model in terms of outreach or, or uh, service to the community. We've chosen that way in that way, but not in terms of the Holy Spirit. Not in terms of the Holy Spirit. Not in terms of love, necessarily. <laughs> There's a moral override. Uh, enlightened self-interest. We, we do these things and it makes us feel good. It's not the same as love. Your point is brilliantly taken there, yes. Right. We do not challenge you. We might disagree, but I assume that we're both good people, and I want to live that out with you. 
Yes, that's a, that's a perfect expression of it, yeah. Uh, and, and, and finding the communities isn't, you have to persuade your investor to give you a $250 a month bar uh, stipend. Uh, <laughs> and if you can do that, you can do anything. Uh, and uh, even if you're drinking Coca-Cola, uh, that's, where, that's where they're going to be, many of them. Uh, is, is the pubs are terribly important. Obviously, we're not talking about a bunch of drunks, uh, but we're just talking about the, the third good place is right now secular. And the trick is going to be to make the sacred space the third good place. That's the trick. Were you fixing to say something, John? Uh, I, I just wanted to throw out there, this is jumping back a couple of questions, but um, I heard a little bit in some of the questions about technology, the use of the internet, that sort of stuff, um, a little bit of fear creeping in there uh, about the cost and, and that sort of stuff. And it, I think it's really important to recognize, and, and maybe we just don't have a good repository or a good resource to point people towards, but there, are, there is so much that's available free um, and easy to use because uh, just just as it is out in the technological community, so it is in the emerging sure. community, this idea of open sourceness. Absolutely uh, open sources. Sort of, I mean, you've got free tools like Twitter that we're using today, Facebook for social networking people. I'm, I'm trying right now to see if there's anybody interested uh, in Church of Our Savior, and hopefully by extension, like anyone could join in with this. They don't have to be affiliated yeah. with the church uh, to join me in doing uh, uh, something during Lent. Um, and uh, so, and, WordPress to create websites. Oh Lord, help you! But yes, <laughs> almost instantaneously and for free. Yeah. Um, that anybody that can use a word processor can update. Um, and uh, so, so there's stuff that's out there that doesn't cost the church twenty thousand dollars to get started. And, and I think that there's every reason to assume that the church may be, the, the larger church may be in the business of being about to begin to commence to hear uh, some relief on the hardware, uh, which is is the cost. Uh, I, I, I know that the church building fund has just this week um, enacted a, in, in session a um, uh, decision to begin to talk about emergence uh, and to uh, establish a committee that will begin to work on uh, tapping some of those funds or showing, uh, I mean, church building fund is a logical place. It's just they're not building buildings when they do that. Uh, so I think there's some, re but you're abs you want them to quit. Yeah. Oh, 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 I, th I thought you were saying, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> And a lot of that's going to change when Web3 gets here. When Web3 gets here in about six months, of course, it's been six months for the last, what, eight or nine months that we were going to get it. But when Web3 gets here and you've actually got three-dimensional space, uh, you can have, uh, you could actually feel that you were present here, literally. You could see the backs of, of oh, you could see the shiny ball head. No, uh, yeah, you could see the backs of people. You could walk around. You could go over. Uh, and and uh, once Web3 comes, it's going to be a lot better, even, to do instead of watching people sitting in a room while somebody yaks on. Uh, you're going to be able to move around in the room uh, and actually be there physically. The only thing I was telling John this morning, the only thing we haven't done, and I'm serious, is to figure out how to add scent. Uh, to the, because one of the ways we know each other, like it or not, primitive as it sounds, your local doggy tail, uh, is that uh, we, we know each other by scent. We've got body language now, and we've got uh, intonation of the voice and all of that, but we haven't got smell yet. Uh, and uh, as soon as we get smell, we can really make virtual reality work. Um, and uh, Publisher 2 actually tried scenting paper um, to, to try to make books uh, have an, exci uh, an, an excited level of odor. 
um, uh, to, uh, well, to try to defend against Kendall and things like that. Uh, it, it didn't work all that well. But that's, that's the last horizon for what you're talking about, is scent. I do too. I love the floodplain. And I want to offer another metaphor that is similar um, from David Bucher's book, Traces of Renewal, yeah. which I commend to anyone who is interested in the kind of spacing. He talks about the fact that there are many species of fire that are not Yeah, yeah. I love the fact that we're getting metaphors. That was a good question. <laughs> it's a seminal question. Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. I've been thinking about this whole thing about uh, fear and change. Mm -hmm. What, you know, kind of holds us back and uh, about sort of human developmental theory and kind of what we said earlier. So if we had small children, I would just guess about anything to create a worshiping community that they will be able to follow through their mm -hmm. We'll do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Well, you've been a wonderful audience, and uh, I, I, I think it's, uh, what, we're 15 minutes over? Is that not right? It's 12 before 12? Oh, my goodness. I had the wrong time. So do right on. I beg your pardon. <laughs> Maya Culpa. I was breaking my neck to get through here. Okay. All right. Yes. Yes. Life and on and on. And I think, but do I want to go the full distance? And at a particular point, he said, don't take away my sacraments. Yes. And I think that's something that we need to tune into. And I'd like you to kind of. Sacramental worship is, is a big part of the attraction of Anglicanism. Uh, you know, and it's an open table, uh, and uh, it, it absolutely is. Now, sometimes they take, like Icon, the Book of Common Prayer and use that, but what they're consecrating is not unleavened bread, you know, or, or necessarily wine. It, uh, it can be beer and Twinkies or whatever, uh, by which they mean no desecration uh, at all. Those are just culturally relevant. But yes, absolutely, and, and the the... Disciplines, you know, don't take away the disciplines. Uh, talk to us about fasting. Uh, only uh, make us understand why we're doing it, and we don't want to have a whole lot of conversation about it with each other. Just quietly talk to us about how you really do Sabbath. What does it mean to do Shabbos? Uh, what's that like? Talk to us about fixed hour prayer. What does it mean? Those, those aren't sacraments, obviously, but they're the other part. Of the, the individual, if you will, individualized uh, liturgical living. Uh, and, and the sacraments are terribly important. That's the reason I love his word, uh, Jay's word of uh, sanctuary, because it's there where you get the comfort of, of the sacraments. And we can give those things. We can give, but don't take them away from me. I'll fight you tooth and nail. You know, that's why I'm Anglo merchant. I, will, I, I never thought I'd be even Anglo merchant. I just was sitting there watching the traffic go by because that was my job, you know, and you watch it long enough and it begins to get off on you, you know, I, I sort of, it, it, so I'm, I'm definitely angle emergent, but that's right, and, and I better die soon because I, you know, but whatever, uh, but, uh, but yeah, sacraments have got to be there. I still believe in apostolic succession, even if it is through the year. Uh, and that's, that's one of my, one of my biggest questions and ponderings is, um, is the flexibility of, 
institution like the Episcopal Church or any denomination really when it comes to sacraments and ordination and that sort of stuff. And if we're flexible enough to be um, to be encouraging and um, and fertilizing new communities uh, or new gatherings of people, and they happen to be small gatherings at a pub or in people's homes, um, what role then does the sacrament? How how can the sacrament be available, um, you know, to small groups of 12, 15, 20 That's right. people um, without a priest or, or a deacon? It, it won't be there on site without a priest. It will be, uh, or it, it will be in a, in a Protestant sense. It won't be in an Episcopal uh, or, or an Anglican sense uh, where the consecration is done by whoever's there and whoever's there. Uh, but if, if we do our trick right as Anglicans, I think, when we do open up then the parish church to uh, having a service maybe every Thursday afternoon at 5.30 or, or at 6 o'clock or something where all are, are welcome and where it is Celtic, where it is Taze, where it is wild, where, where it is alternative worship and where the sacraments happen. I really love Jay's notion of, of turning it into a sanctuary in the old sense uh, or what I heard him say when he was using those words. Uh, but um, I think an emergent would say, if, if I hear them correctly, that the minute you sit down to supper with the six or eight who are your, your family, you have entered into a sacramental uh, thing. And, and part of that is that they don't have the liturgical sense of sacrament, uh, which is what you're talking about. I, yeah. Yes. Group that was meeting on the Pentecostal church, and the answer was no. And so he just kind of was saying, "Well, how is this going to work if, if we continue?" It's just basically the same question that was asked here. And I don't know. I don't know that for Anglo Americans it is enough to have supper. I think for Anglo Americans it's it's not going to be enough. They're going to want to have it. A deacon's mass is obviously uh, the way around it, and I don't understand the resistance. Many sitting diocesans are, are opposed to a deacon's mass, uh, and that's what Chad's talking about. It, a deacon's mass, uh, uh, it's uh, legitimate, but isn't it not at the discretion of the sitting diocesan? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, and I, I'll be honest, I've done one once or twice when there wasn't a clergyman around, and um, we had to go for it. And I just said, Canterbury, forgive me, and here we go, God. Uh, and, and, and went with it. Because <laughs> you know, uh, my limb license sure doesn't go there. Um, but I showed up one Easter dawn at one of my shut-ins, and half the neighborhood was in her living room. And they had come to do it with us. And, you know, yeah, I just did it. And I stood at our altar once, and there wasn't a priest in sight, and there had been a huge storm, and 30 people wandered into church. I don't know why. I don't know why I was there, but anyway, uh, and I did it. So it's and said to our diocesan, I did this thing, uh, and and he, you know, he absolved me, whatever. Um, but uh, what could he do? It's I mean, give me back what you just done. I don't think so, you know. But but. I think you're absolutely right. I think Chad's right. I've heard Chad. I didn't see him on Anglo Emergent doing it, but that's a, a real uh, a real source of concern to him because um, he's a real traditional liturgist. Yeah. Excuse me. You were showing. Oh, you've got one too. Is yours an Asus? Yes. Ah, love mine. Okay. I was uh, wanted to just offer two things. I guess it's um, Michael Dodd in the uh, Thank God for Evolution and what he states in there about day language and night language. Of, about how the things of day language are our scriptures, our traditions, and things of that nature, and our night language is those of the Holy Spirit. And there you God. go. And and how to and and not to think of either as wrong, uh, and that's what we have a tendency to do in the church, and that's where that fear comes in about balancing which language <laughs> is the right language you know, uh, to offer. Yeah. And then uh, also in um, Psychological Mind, there was a, uh, there's a website of a priest who does communion over the web. Uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, 
the people who participated in the communion over the web were speaking of how wonderful of a spiritual experience it was for them. And we get lost in the day language of saying that it has to be a certain way. And if it's not that way, then that's right. You know, then it's not church. And and that's us and not them. That's our problem. And you know, saying that the language has to look this way. And it doesn't. If we that's are right. it does not. receptive to God's love, that's right. open and receptive to what God is trying to have for us. It's interesting you should say that about uh, it was summer before us for about six weeks, I think. There was on um, the House of Bishops and Deputies listserv, there was this kind of minor brouhaha about whether you could consecrate online. Uh, you know, is it possible, uh, you know, can you do that? Um, and they never resolved it. They ran from it, actually. It's one of the few times I've ever seen them run because, because the language doesn't allow for that, uh, you know. And yet, if you do have sites, where priests are, indeed, or, or some form of priest, uh, is, is giving the Eucharist. Um, and part of it had to do with the cathedral and second life. Could they serve the elements? Could they celebrate the Eucharist? Uh, and could an avatar take the sacrament? Uh, is that possible? And um, that's a whole area of church law we're going to have to go into. Uh, you're absolutely right. There's no question about that because it's happening. Uh, Barna says that uh, this year, um, there will be 20 million uh, of our fellow Americans who never ever go in bricks and mortar of any sort, including pubs for church, who are going to do their whole religious experience on the web. That's a lot of people, 20 million of our fellow Americans, who will worship, who will be, you know, but it will be just there. Yes? It's a problem. Uh, and, uh, it's a problem. And what's to say if there's no leadership and no uh, self-direction other than what percolates up, that it doesn't end up going off in some what, something that we might call heretical, and it may even lead to what we call the sphere of Christianity. Uh, and so I think engagement with a, with a group like this, without it having any kind of boundaries of its own, becomes very problematical, not because we're not willing to engage them, but because yes. It's, it's a very good question, and it's going to be a problem. But I, I think the, the answer that Emergent would give you is that they call themselves Wiki Church, uh, which is off of Wikipedia, uh, that ultimately the crowd, uh, when it gets skewed too far one way, uh, the, the crowd, the group, the beloved community will know it and bring it back, which begs the question, I think. It begs the question when I say this to me, because I think the question then is, all right, so you're going to bring it back to what? To being a good Baptist? I don't think so. Uh, are you going to bring it back to being a good Presbyterian? I don't think so. I mean, you know, where are you bringing it back to? They will. They are. They do. And it, that will happen. That is truly going to happen. That's part of this process. Every time one thing seems to happen, that part has happened. What is not clear to me, and what I, I thought your question was going, how does the institutional church interface with that distinctly new form of theology? Uh, you know, how, how can we reach out and help. Yeah, you know, that's why I, I thought you were, were really saying, because that's where the rubber's going. Yes, there's going to be, there's no question, there's going to be new theology here. Pray God it is not syncretistic. That, that China scares me to death. You know, syncretism has never been as wild as it is in China right now. We can't afford to go that way. We can't afford to lose definitions. Uh, but how you, 
how you're in effect. How does Roman Catholicism, when you get right down to it, all Protestants uh, started as Roman Catholics, because that's all there was. Uh, and all emergence started either as Roman Catholics, Orthodox, or, or Protestant or Pentecostal. Uh, that's, that's where they're coming up out from. So to some extent, they know what the institution is. I don't know how you interface. The, the Roman Church did a really lousy job, as we all know, of interfacing uh, with Protestantism as it emerged. And there was no question Protestantism was heretical. I mean, the Pope still says it's heresy. <laughs> Last week, or the first of this week, he pronounced that it was heresy. All over again, thank you, Benedict. Uh, like we haven't heard it before. Um, so we're going to use those terms. What we've never had before is that funny circle of, of hyphenated. So the Anglo emergent, the Presby emergent, the, you know, the, radi the radical loyalist or the loyal radicals. Uh, and I don't know what happens. I, my, my guess, based just, and I would have only guessed this about the last 18, 20 months, is that what looked like was going to be the center coming up out of this thing, uh, emergence, Christianity, was going to be it. I think we have not re begun to realize that it's also going to, in its swirl, pick up the hyphenated. Uh, and that the hyphenated are going to somehow, what, what we get is going to be uh, a mishmash of Protestant traditions, I think, uh, mixed with, with this new mindset. I, I, I think that's what's happening. In which case, the hyphenated may be the way back to connect with Jerusalem. If that doesn't happen, we're in a world of hurt, I think. But yes, it's going to be a whole new understanding of Christianity. In a way, one of them, the, the, the atonement is where it's going to, well, I long since lost that. Uh, the, uh, the Christian particularity and exclusivitism have got to go. Uh, I don't think there's any question. And from the emergence point of view, we may not get rid of them as Anglicans, but they're going to have to go. They've already gone. Uh, we just haven't held services, but the body is dead. Uh, and, uh, and, and what you do with the whole business of the atonement, that's going to be where the ship wrecks, uh, or where the, the separation really becomes so clean cut, uh, cut so obvious, that the institution is going to have to either make some accommodation or just kind of walk away. Because that, that one is definitely changing. There, there's nothing we can do to stop that one. Um, when that happens, when we, get, when we get the theology up front on that, uh, then the question is going to be, what does happen uh, to the loyal radicals? Uh, which way do they go? Can they shape it? Uh, and, and the interesting thing to me as this sort of heats up is that Bishop Wright, N.T. Wright, <coughs> And, and uh, I have said to him, so it's, it's no secret, I was not a follower of Wright particularly. I, I, I read the books because I, I needed to, but not because I was persuaded uh, necessarily until he did that surprised by joy, or uh, I think it was surprised by anyway. And I thought, oh, whoa, you know, something has shifted now. And surprised by hope uh, that came out April of last year, I guess, is an amazing, he's gone from a modernist to a, hmm, I'm not sure, to a postmodern theologian speaking as an Anglican bishop to his Anglo emergent or fresh expressions people and to frankly emergence Christians. And and the thing that fascinates me about Surprise by Hope is he makes it very clear that the kingdom of God is here and now. Uh, that Protestantism's insistence on the hereafter and on individual salvation and all of that is wrong, wrong headed. It's the beloved community. It's not your little soul. It's, it's the community you're in. And, and we're in parallel uh, things. Atemporal, extra intellectual, but the kingdom is here. And the, the trick, so to speak, he doesn't use the word trick, but the, but the trick is to become small enough, humble enough, to be able to slip through the eye of the needle into that other way of being that is the kingdom here and now. It's an amazing, it comes closer than anything I know of. And I wrote him and said, this is just amazing. It's beautifully argued, as everything he does is argued well. Um, but it's beautifully argued that that's, that's how we're going to accommodate, is that we're going to recognize that the kingdom of God is here now and is big enough to accept all of those who come in individually humble enough to not violate the beloved community. But that, you know, that's...
Um, it works in rhetoric, whether it works, uh, you know, or whether it ends up in the Inquisition and the Thirty Years' War like it did last time. Who knows? But he's at least got the words. And he's got the principle laid down. Uh, and that book is so like wild. Uh, so it's, it's being heard. It's not like it's sitting on the shelf in the seminary library. Yeah. Yes. And I, I think in my small circles, I'm more apt to share some more, share the joy of a new diet with someone more easily than share my faith. Absolutely. And I think that immersions have found, you know, I, I was doing this refugee ministry thing, it was a beautiful thing, because, you know, they came from Peru, they were from a genocide, so, we, you know, it was so clear, we, you know. But I think that to go to your neighbor or to the local pub, That's right. That's your $250 beer bill uh, and line item in the vestry. Yeah. Everywhere. That's right. And, and, and it's because <laughs> yeah, they didn't. They just happened. Uh, there was no intention. Uh, it just, they're sitting there, they're in an office, uh, or they share a cubicle, uh, you know, or they're a side by side on an assembly line, and the conversation gets around to something kind of like God talk, and the first thing you know, they're talking, and then they're going for a Coke or tea or a beer or whatever, and it just springs up that way. Now, having said that, I know zillions of priests, literally, who do, I mean, out of their own pocket, go buy a beer. I, I, I met one young man uh, not oh, three or four weeks ago who said, I am so tired of having to go to the bar every Friday night. Uh, and I said, what? And he said, you know, when you, you really get tired of it after a while. But, but every Friday night uh, he's there. And, and he's spun off two or three groups that are now on their way to becoming emergence communities, uh, just sitting there. Um, but it, it, it's a toughie, and it doesn't bring anything back to Jerusalem. Uh, it, it, it really doesn't. But they're there. You're not going to be, I don't think you're going to be able to make them. The only way you can make them, maybe, is if you've got some technophiles uh, of, of any age group uh, in your parish who really want to try alt worship uh, and who begin that way uh, into alt worship and may uh, build it. But the problem is the communities are out here, as you said, and you got the church here, the building. You know, and if there's anything an emergence is allergic to, it's a building. And there's a contradiction there, too. You know, don't, want, don't want this building. Don't want to think that $2 million has been spent while people are starving. Don't want it on my conscience that I spent money like this. It is absolutely wrong. What are you thinking about? Not only did you pay for it, you have to maintain it and you buy staff, but could we borrow it Thursday afternoon? <laughs> you know, and you can't make them see that. Uh, that's a good question. When uh, the monastic, and there's a strong element of neo-monasticism uh, in this. Uh, the ones that are most visible are Shane, are Shane Claiborne or Jonathan Wilson Hargrove. Uh, Wilson Hargrove is Rutba House uh, in North Carolina. Uh, Shane, 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 I'll say it right in a minute, uh, is uh, <coughs> a simple way in Philadelphia. But they, they too are everywhere. There must be somewhere near 5,000 at least of those monastic communities. One of the most beautiful ones is Old St. Elizabeth's in Cincinnati. Uh, which is occupying a, an abandoned uh, Roman Catholic uh, cathedral and uh, rectory and convent uh, as a bad community. But the, there's a spectrum, to, uh, they call it neo-monasticism. I'm not sure I like that term, but, 
but uh, it's not mine to say. I just find it an awkward term. But it runs the spectrum. Sometimes that will be just I vow, I vow with you three that we're going to meet on, on Tuesday afternoons or just come together, and I will be responsible during the week for you, and you will be responsible for me in our spiritual formation, in our religious formation. And we will, we will pledge uh, in the name of Jesus Christ uh, to be a little cell in his body. All the way over here to, to ones like uh, Rutba uh, in a simple way, where it's uh, a vow of common purse and co mustard seeds one, a common purse, a common table, uh, and uh, some of them even go so far as obediency and constancy. When you get over here from about middle of the spectrum over, you get a sliding scale of what happens to the money. That's not to say that this half of the scale isn't tithing. They probably are, uh, but they're tithing to, to some organization. But, they're doing. but when you get over to this part, you get uh, many of these houses, because they are common purse, common table, will use 15% of each community member's uh, income to live off of. And the other 85% will be put with the other 85% of all the other families uh, and will be sent in mission work. Um, some of them do the same things we do. They have a mission abroad. Uh, you know, they actually have a congregation that they're supporting. Uh, or they will do something uh, locally. But uh, 15, to live on 15% is, is not unheard of in the upper end of that monastic movement, uh, which is pretty amazing. You talk about being able to be small enough to get through that gate uh, into the kingdom of God. Uh, and they, uh, with that money, they also furnish a lot of, uh, they fund a lot of justice movements. They're very big into justice. And, uh, and a lot of environmental, uh, this is a very green movement. If you've seen um, the cover of uh, McLaurin's Generous Orthodoxy, where it says why I am a <laughs> Presbyterian, uh, Lutheran, Green, uh, you know, all those things, well, what he's really saying is the truth. Um, but yeah, the money, uh, to the extent that the money tells the tale, the tale being told is very remarkable. And, and the tale really is, N.T. Wright's right, correct. It, you know, it's getting small enough to go through. And, and also, one of the things that's happening in the great emergence, of course, not only is the rise of technology, but the flattening of the middle class. And that's one of the things that's going to get the Episcopal Church, there's no question. Uh, the middle class is being flattened, uh, and has been being flattened for 50 or 60 years now. Uh, so they don't have, to the extent that the, the younger emergence, anyway, don't have that call uh, to, to middle class values. They really don't care whether you got on designer clothes or not. It would be nice if they were clean enough so you didn't smell. But beyond that, it really doesn't matter. Now, you better be wired. You know, it would be shameful if you didn't have an iPhone or an iPod or, or, or so it weren't wired in some way. But the rest of the middle class values just aren't there. Uh, and they're not wired in in any way. They're not going to be appreciated because they're just, they don't connect. Um, and so you don't have that drain of money. Now, I contend at some point the kids growing up in those monastic uh, situations um, are going to have to have a college education. Uh, and uh, I don't think the communities have necessarily, it's like maybe we borrow your building on Friday night. Uh, it, it, but all of these things, every time one of them started, there's that period of passion. It's a honeymoon, you know, uh, where everything's wonderful. And then the, some of the realities begin to check in. Uh, but right now, the money is one place you cannot fault them. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, yes? Um, what would you say for communities that have a communal worship like St. Gregory of Nyssa in this whole conversation? St. Gregory of Nyssa now frankly says that they are an emergent church. They, they just absolutely. Uh, 30 years ago when they started, uh, I th That's when I first went to Oh, OK. I'm sorry. I thought, I, oh, OK. That's right. And every time it'll get you. Yes, okay. Uh, St. Gregory of Nyssa in San Francisco, by the way, is where the Anglo Emergent Steering Committee is meeting in three weeks. Uh, we're being hosted by St. Gregory of Nyssa. Uh, when Donald Shell, uh, when Don and Rick, the founding pastors, uh, retired uh, or, or turned the congregation over, I think it's really what they did, they didn't retire, uh, three years ago now, 
um, they began then to say, quite frankly, we're, we're an emergent church. Uh, our congregation. They were not even allowed into the diocese, as you probably know, for a, until about, what, six years ago or something like that, or seven, uh, when the diocese uh, welcomed in, uh, you know, and accepted the fact. Because what they're doing is, is half Syriac uh, or Oriental, anyway, or maybe two-thirds Syriac and Oriental, uh, and um, it, it is, is Anglican in the broadest sense. It really is first and second century church. But it is enormously moving. Uh, Sarah Miles is, uh, as of three weeks ago, uh, associate there, um, uh, not ordained, uh, but is associate there. Uh, she moves 9,000 tons of food a week out of that place to San Francisco's homeless. I mean, I don't even know what that looks like. I mean, I, I've, been, I've stood there and seen it, but it, it boggles the mind uh, how they do it. They're, they're emergent in every single way. And it is, is it not, the most beautiful, exquisite space you have ever seen. But it's sanctuary in the way that Jay was talking. Yeah. It's, it's sanctuary. I hold it up in front of me as a way that, as you put it, uh, that the sanctuary becomes the third good place. It's the third good place, and it's a perfect example. Uh, Karen Sloan's The Church of the Apostles in Seattle is not quite as beautiful a space, but it's by way of becoming a sanctuary. Uh, in, in that sense. Uh, but it's a self-immolating thing. Now, St. Gregory of Nyssa works because they've got the money. And uh, with any luck at all, some of our churches are going to begin to work because we're hitting up some of our wealthier folk uh, to do this thing. But it's, it's a trick to do. You've got to be able to serve them, too, uh, in some way. The oldest emerging church I know of in this country that, uh, to lay claim is uh, Irving Bible Church in Irving, Texas. Uh, was started in 69, uh, and they're now 40 years old, and they are uh, going through a process of trying to figure out whether they want to keep that name or go to emergence or, you know, or, 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 what are we doing? 21,000 members, I think. It's one of the, one of the emergence ones that's, uh, that's a megachurch. Megachurch doesn't have anything to do with your theology. It has to do with your size, as you know, uh, and it's one of the emergence. Uh, but, uh, and, and the first book that I know of, the first um, scholarly study or quasi-scholarly that ever said uh, the emerging church uh, was uh, Osborne uh, and Larson in uh, 70, 1970. Uh, and it was, the book is called The Emerging Church. And they're the first ones. So Irving was there uh, a year before we actually got the first here's what the thing is uh, uh, sort of thing. Uh, out there in, in public conversation. But I think St. Gregory of Nyssa is the sine qua non. Uh, uh, that's what we ought to all be doing. And it has, I mean, you could go into that as a person who was afraid, you could go into and say, I recognize this and this and this, and yet it's still the unchurched person and engages. Absolutely. It's got the whole shebang. That's right. The doors are wide open. Yeah. Just come right in. Yeah, man. That's right. And, um, and so they, I mean, it's, it's quintessentially every uh, every announcement, That's right. Every last thing is geared not for those of us who are comfortable and know what EYC and ECW are about, but for That's right. Congregation sits in choir uh, like this. When you preach there, it's unnerving uh, because you're sitting down. You preach sitting down uh, in the chancel, and they're watching you. And uh, when it's over, then there's 20 minutes of deconstructing your sermon to see if the people agreed with what you just said. It's Wiki Church. Uh, and, 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 and it is wide open. Uh, it's absolutely people come in. And Sarah Miles, uh, who is now an associate there, uh, wandered in. Good Jew. Uh, did exactly what you're talking about. Just wandered in and was so overwhelmed. She said, I don't even know why I went in. It was just so beautiful. I went in. And then that fool put that thing in my mouth, and my whole body blew apart. I mean, she's got the most dramatic conversion story. Eat this bread. 
uh, that you know you, you ever heard. Yeah, yeah. I just want to tie this back to your comments on the Holy Spirit. Um, That's a real important X factor here. It, it, there's a couple connections I'm making. The spiritual but not religious understand the Holy Spirit. The thing that Gregory and Nippon does so well is they just present the church. That's right. In fact, it's so not worn down. It's condensed. It's like you know your first drink of orange juice is the condensed version. They give it to you. That's right. Cognac would be better, but yeah. <laughs> They don't nuance it in some way where you might try to get it. Just, no, we understand that you get the Holy Spirit, so we're going to give it to you. Yeah. Here it is. It's yeah. called church, and this is the kingdom, and this is the, this is the grace of people. Accept it or not. And they just keep presenting it. But if you present it openly and fairly and lovingly, to use that word again, and recognize the power of the Holy Spirit to move within it and let go of that anxiety, I mean, that's the piece, of, I mean, for me, yeah. is the hardest thing. I'm anxious, so I'm trying to find sure, you're some anxious. other way to say the word sacrament. Don't. Just say, sacrament, damn it. <laughs> I mean, but this is the thing, the conversation about, I mean, it's, so, it's, it's a lot of fun for me to listen to you all talk about who gets to make Jesus happen at the table. But <laughs> well, you'll get over it. <laughs> but the most important thing is that you have to realize that people desperately want the sacrament. They don't want the watered-down version of it. They really want it. Yeah. So, I mean, as opposed to tweaking it and nuancing it, just give them church. I mean, that's the thing that if you listen to the emergent folk talk, that's what they all uncover. And the reason why they go back to these ancient traditions is because they desperately want them. Yeah, exactly, because they desperately want them. You want us to shut up now, huh? Right? No, you take one more. One more. Oh, well, okay. How do you see the emerging church compared against the evangelical conservative? Um, you come here and we'll tell you exactly what the... What yeah, the, the, the foundationalist. Uh, the, the foundationalists, of course, also on, on a spectrum. Uh, and, and you have those that, are, that drop back to the corner, uh, that absolutely, um, I don't know how to do it with that. Um, uh, I don't know, in, in the book I do it this way. Uh, but you've got the conservatives down here, and they're about a quarter of what is actually furnishing the emergence. But in each of these, in the Pentecostals here, in the liturgicals here, and in the social justice here, up here, there's about 7 to 10 percent who feel a godly need, a real vocation, an honest to goodness, serious vocation to be sure that this thing doesn't happen, who, who are persuaded that it is their Christian duty to prevent this thing. Uh, and, and up here, we call him, you know, Akinola or we call him Bob Duncan, or we call him Jack Schofield. Uh, uh, but when we get through the calling, we've also got to understand that they, f they, they serve a purpose. If, if we didn't have that sort of breaking back like that, B-R-A-K, uh, breaking back, we'd spin off, or the ship would tilt without ballast, is how it's sometimes put. So they're a necessary part. What you're also, I think, saying is that down here, in this conservative quadrant, in evangelicalism, you've got more than just corners. You've got people who are really struggling against this thing, and you're, you're absolutely right. They're not struggling as violently as, for instance, Mel Gibson is up here, uh, or a Reformed Presbyterian Church, or Missouri Synod uh, of Lutheran. Uh, it's not that kind, or some branches of, of Assemblies of God. It's not that kind of aggressive uh, <coughs> attack, but it's a very, it's, it's, a, it's, it's broken into circles of how traditional or, or retraditioning or progressive they are. And they too have a, I feel like I'm not answering this well, they too have a sliding scale. But what, you, what you've got right here is a strong part of Sola Scriptura, and it's stronger here. But there's more energy in this quadrant than any other, which is why it's always gone this way. The energy from the time this thing started 50 years ago in this country has come out of the evangelicals trying to escape the very thing you're talking about. Just knowing that it won't play in Poughkeepsie or being up to here with being told you can't dance on Sunday or play cards uh, and that it's in the Bible. Uh, and, and, you know, it's the kind of people I like to say to, sweetie, we follow a man who changed water into wine because he didn't have time to go to the liquor store. Now, what's your problem? Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but they're there. But the, the, the energy is coming up. Every once in a while you get one of them that goes this way uh, against the tide. Uh, Jim Wallace. 
is the best example of somebody that went counter to the, to the, but this is the energy coming. So what we do is that we use them as really fire starters. Uh, they're, they're a wonderful uh, sort of kindling, if you will, uh, because there's a tension there. Uh, and, and there's a ten huge tension within, if, if you're going to talk denominationally, Southern Baptist Church uh, or Southern Baptist Convention uh, is a, a gorgeous example of the stages of this as you eventually get to cooperative. Uh, down here you're getting one or two of their seminary presidents now saying things like, we maybe need to reconsider birth control. Uh, because the numbers are dying, which is, you know, if you can't convert them, breed them, uh, is, is kind of a cynical way to look at it. Uh, but uh, or we need to maybe reconsider infant uh, baptism and that kind of thing. So it, you've got a whole spectrum. Uh, but, uh, and, and some of the emergents are still right here. Mark Driscoll, be a beautiful example of an emerging that's right here. He's caught in that, and he's not swirling all the way, uh, you know. I don't know whether that answers your question. I feel like I was stumbling around, but anyway. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks, folks. It was it was great. There you go.